Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Liverpool and Happy New Year everybody and on the day that Mr. Johnson announced uh, another third lockdown here in the UK, us Liverpool fans were dealt uh, doubly, ba doubly bad news pretty much at the same time with this uh, defeat against Southampton in the Premier League. Uh, yet another defeat for us in the Premier League against a team that... Uh, we probably shouldn't be losing to a team that obviously have improved a lot over the past year and are a very good team with some very good players, but a team that we should nevertheless be winning. And, and after the, particularly after the poor performances uh, and results, both against West Brom and Newcastle, uh, both the players, the management, the fans were all expecting a reaction in this game and a positive reaction from a Liverpool perspective in terms of creating chances, scoring goals. Um, you know, we've been fairly good defensively, but, you know, more more from the attacking side of things, which we haven't really said for the last couple of years, we needed to see something more and something different in this game because we have we have looked uh, kind of just lost at sea in the last couple of games in terms of how to break down uh, defences that don't necessarily park the bus, but defend in a way where they get numbers behind the ball, uh, which we've struggled with. Uh, and so there was a lot of hope going into this game that that kind of just the, the negativity of the last couple of results would be turned into something positive. Uh, but unfortunately, that wasn't the case uh, for us. And that was started off right from the beginning of the game um, when uh, Southampton got an early goal. It was a, it was what, less than two minutes in and um, James Ward-Prowse played a very good uh, free kick just over the top um, on, the, on the kind of short side uh, from a free kick that was fairly fairly quite far out it must have been at least 40 yards out it was chipped in behind the defenders he was just on side I think Jordan Henderson um, just reacted and, and kind of moved uh, slightly ahead of the defenders uh, of the other defenders uh, and pushed the line back a little bit which helped play Danny Ings on side and then he just hooked a beautiful ball um, with his left foot over his shoulder uh, Allison had absolutely no chance and, and they were ahead uh, pretty much like before anything could really happen in the game before we'd settle down or anything like that and uh, with our kind of confidence being quite fragile after the past couple of games, uh, that was possibly the worst start that we could have had, um, because we obviously because of all the reasons we said before, we, uh, just before it, we, we were been struggling to make chances, struggling to score goals, uh, and what we didn't need it was the need to score goals, um, because uh, yeah, we just haven't looked like that. But before we get into kind of analysing the game, let's talk a bit about the lineups. Um, Henderson at centre back, an interesting choice. Now. Um, it's a surprising one for me, I think. I, I think we, we've obviously... He, he's played centre-back in the past when we've had injuries there. Uh, you know, literally this time last year when we were in the Club World Cup, he played... I think it was in the semi-final he played the centre-back. He's played centre-back a couple of times. He's a very confident, um, experienced, uh, very tactically aware player. Uh, so definitely a player who can play in that position. But seeming the fact that Reese Williams and both Nat Phillips have done fairly well... I wouldn't say they've set the world alight, but they haven't really made any glaring errors or or anything like that in the games they've played. Uh, and Klopp seems to have so far shown a lot of confidence in them, playing them both in the Premier League and Reese Williams in the Champions League. So it was it seems strange that he would uh, switch it in this game. Maybe there's a fatigue side of things, but you know I would expect that would that would that would kind of hinder um, Henderson as well. But but Reese Williams and Nat Phillips have been kind of interchanging. Neither one of them has been playing. Kind of 90 minutes after 90 minutes. If anything, it's Fabinho that probably needs a needs a rest. So that was very strange to see. I'm not sure why Klopp did that. Um, I'll talk about it a little later. But I don't think he really had a bad game. Um, it was just it was just a strange decision. I thought given the confidence that Klopp has shown in some of the younger defenders so far this season. And then the other kind of big news was the absolute kind of rip up and change of the midfield of the midfield three. Gini Wijnaldum, the only one keeping his place and Thiago uh, and Oxlade-Chamberlain starting. Thiago having just come on uh, and played about 10-15 minutes against Newcastle. Um, and he seemed a bit more rushed into the team than maybe Klopp would have liked. Uh, we've seen what he done. he's done with Oxlade-Chamberlain over the last kind of almost three to four, even five games, uh, just giving Oxlade-Chamberlain a little bit more time, a little bit more time. Um, and I, I think ideally Klopp probably would have wanted to do the same to Thiago. However, kind of seeing how uh, kind of how the lack of creativity we had in the last couple of games, uh, now that he was fit, uh, wanted to get him in the team, but it was great to see him play 90 minutes. And I was really excited by seeing that midfield. One of the things I've talked about and been a little bit critical of on these episodes for the past couple of episodes now is around 
how our thinking about the the balance in our midfield between the defensive side and the kind of creative side and i think klopp's gone a little bit too safe with his choices uh in terms of the kind of the defensive side of things and sacrificed that creative side of the midfield but i was really excited to see um this midfield because i thought with genie particularly and tiago is the more kind of deeper um number six position that i thought we had a, a better balance of uh, kind of defensive solidity and attacking prowess um, but ultimately it didn't really make too much difference and that's again something we'll talk about a little bit later on but after that first goal it was a very very good goal as we talked about earlier um, we kind of I'd say grew into the first half uh, they were defending fairly narrow I would say their back four were kind of defending the width of the penalty box which is you know exactly how you would instruct the team to play against us um you know let, let Mane and Salah have the ball, ball out wide they're not really going to hurt you from there they must score a wonder goal or whatever but you know that's that's what it is but you know the cross is into the box it's just Firmino on his own uh, and the the Southampton centre-backs would always fancy them fancy their chances uh 2v1 against Firmino in the box um but yeah we, we kind of we grew into the game uh, and we had more of the ball and we were getting the ball kind of into the front players, mainly Sadio Mane. But we weren't really creating chances. And that, that showed in the fact that we didn't have any any shots on target in the first half. Fraser Forster, who was a keeper who hasn't played for something like 18 months, uh, we didn't test at all, even with some long shots or, or anything like that. You, you thought, you know, with a new keeper coming in, yes, he's got some experience, but, you know, you want to test him a little bit. But we, we kind of just, um, we weren't able to do that. And we looked, it looked the game was following a similar pattern to the games uh, against West Brom and Newcastle as well where we had a lot of the ball kind of getting the ball out wide to our, our front three Robertson was making those overlapping runs but but ultimately nothing really coming from from any of our attacks um, and, and actually what it felt like from watching us play is that if we were going to score a goal was going to come from a mistake or, or something that happened something that's really unfortunate from a Southampton, Southampton perspective rather than uh, you know, a, a great piece of play or a bit of individual brilliance from one of our players. Uh, it kind of just felt like that was going to be the way we were going to score rather than, um, you know, a fantastic goal, a fantastic piece of play or, or a great bit of skill or whatever. Um, uh, they, Southampton did have a couple of chances in the first half as well. And I talked a little bit about Henderson at centre-back and, and kind of why I thought he was playing there. I think on the whole, he had a fairly okay game. The only other chance that he really kind of probably could have done better on was in the first half where uh, he, he allowed Danny Ings to get in front of him and, and flick a header above him, which fell to Teller and, and he could have easily scored. Um, but un well, fortunately for us and unfortunately for Southampton, the ball just went uh, a couple of yards uh, wide. But I think other than that, Henderson had a fairly good game. In the second half particularly, um, they didn't really push up too high. Uh, we had a lot of the ball controlling in their half. And actually, Henderson was probably playing more inside uh, Southampton's half than he was out. So I think on the whole, it probably didn't negatively affect us um, having him at centre-back. But it's just something that uh, was, was slightly a strange choice, I think. Second half, uh, Thiago, definitely, Thiago in particular definitely controlled the ball a lot better. But not only controlling the ball better, but higher up the pitch. Uh, and we were doing what we do, uh, particularly in the first 10 to 15 minutes, what we do when we're playing really well is when we pen a team in. You know, they just can't escape the ball. If the ball goes long, our defenders sweep it up and get it back into the likes of Henderson and Thiago straight away. Uh, but again, we were having a lot of the ball, but struggling uh, really to break them down. And, and our, our only really... Our only real attacking outlet throughout the entire second half was with Sadio Mane. And it almost seemed at some points we were a one-man team. You know, kind of what you would almost see from a, a Real Madrid, uh, you know, four, five, six seasons ago where it was kind of give the ball to Ronaldo. Uh, let's see what happens in a really tight game or where things weren't working. And that's pretty much how it seemed like we were playing. We weren't really mixing up, you know, going out to the right-hand side and getting Salah involved. It was all very much all down the left. Uh, Carl Walker-Peters, I think he got man of the match and fair dues, he was really, really good um, uh, at keeping Sadi Amane quiet. There were a couple of instances where we saw some questionable tackles in the box, which kind of didn't go to VAR. We saw a handball as well in the second half, which I'm not going to talk about just because we've talked about VAR too much. And honestly, I think there are some bigger problems around Liverpool than complaining about VAR. Um, but yeah, we, Sadi Amane was kind of really the only one that looked like he was going to do anything or that was going to set something up for the team or score himself or whatever. But other than that, yeah, we just looked kind of devoid of ideas. Um, Firmino wasn't getting involved. Uh, Mo Salah seemed like a completely peripheral figure for the entire game other than kind of just running around and trying to close the ball down. Honestly, can't remember anything um, Mo Salah did. Um, 
in the game. I think a player that we are sorely missing from that front three is Diego Jota. Um, he was a great alternative and something different to what our front three offered uh, at the beginning of the season. And that's why I think a big part of why he was successful at the beginning of the season for us was because he was something different. Um, and who we, the, the, op the options we have on the bench just currently aren't good enough. You know, Taki scored a good goal against Crystal Palace and I'm not sure why Klopp's not giving him more time. Um, but uh, Divock is not good enough. Uh, Taki hasn't showed it consistently enough. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's why kind of Klopp's resistant to, to, to change the front three, even if they aren't playing as good. And as much as we've talked about the need for a centre-back in January, I think we either need to buy a, a, new, a new kind of striker in in January or at least begin the search to buy him this summer. Uh, there's obviously rumours of Divock Origi going over to Inter Milan, um, but I definitely do think we need to either start the search or, or actually go ahead and make the purchase of someone else who is going to challenge the front three uh, and give us something a little bit different up front. The one thing I would say, and I don't, I don't want to beat the drum on this, but one of the things that I've suggested over the past couple of Let's Talk Liverpool episodes in playing against teams that, as I said earlier, don't park the bus but just defend kind of narrow and, and fairly deep is why don't we switch up the system, uh, particularly to a 4-4-2, which I think would work much better because it would give us that those wingers that we that we still have and that we use so well. But it would also give us a presence up front, a bit more of a presence up front than that, than we have with just uh, Bobby Firmino. And I think we need that, particularly if we're getting a lot of crosses into the box. And I don't want it to get to a stage where we kind of get to just Klopp's arrogance that he's always going to play the three up front, he's going to play the 4-3-3. I want us to um, adapt uh, to the defences we're playing against and the way the teams are playing against us. And I think 4-4-2 is a good way of doing that. I think overall, we have to keep all of this in perspective. We are still top of the league. Um, yes, the last couple of results in our away form is, is kind of concerning, but we are in the position that we want to be in. You know, we don't want to be in that pack behind us. We might get drawn into it, but we are still top of the league. And I think one of the ways we can get out of this, which we have done in the past... Um, is for a big game and that's exactly what we've got next in terms of Manchester United so I'm hoping you know we saw last season how galvanizing that victory at Anfield against Manchester United was and I'm hoping we can kind of relive some of that energy in the in the next Premier League game we have um, against Manchester United in terms of man of the match like I, I, I'm gonna have to give it to Sadio Mane but there isn't really anyone um, we were that poor again uh, so I'm gonna give it to Sadio Mane not much more else to really say and then finally on the shout out to Klopp um, as I said before, I think it's more just around ch being flexible and changing the system when we play teams that have defense and that defend in the certain way like we've seen in the past couple of games. And I think uh, we need to be flexible now. It's our turn to be flexible and change our system. But that's it for this episode, guys. Thank you all for listening. Uh, and I look, look forward to catching you in the next one.